It's time now for Word Alive from the Upper Room in Gatesville, North Carolina, with Pastor Eric Earhart. Join us in seeing lives changed by the power of God's Word. You're invited to join us in person on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. at 807 Main Street in Gatesville, North Carolina. You can also listen to our live audio podcast at www.ustream.com. And now, today's message. How about turn to your neighbor and tell him, I'm blessed. I, I don't know if you, did you, I don't think you convinced him yet. T- tell him again, say, I'm blessed. <laughs> so often we walk around in life feeling like we have a black cloud over us. Feeling like that um, the world's against us, we're losing, uh, why me, how come this always happens to me, um, and I think you've got to be able to speak some things into existence. You've got to be able to declare some things despite your circumstances. You've got to be able to um, um, affirm in yourself what God is doing in your life. So we're going to try this again. You're going to convince that person beside you. Let them know. Tell them, I am blessed. <laughs> Amen. Now, now tell them they're blessed. Amen. I remember um, I was sharing the other day, I was up in, um, uh, on uh, Interstate 78 where um, uh, the New York-Pennsylvania border comes together. I was on Interstate 68, uh, the family, we were heading over to New York City, just doing some traipsing around the country, a little vacationing, and um, we were trying to find this farm along there, because that's all farm uh, country along there, rolling hills, farm country, and this farm was supposed to have this... Um, corn maze where the kids could go in the corn maze and walk around through this maze and I couldn't find it we were looking for it when we finally did find it it was closed and it was one of those deals where, all right praise the Lord so I pull into this gas station and I'm and I'm asking this um, lady uh, at the counter uh, of a little convenience store gas station I said ma'am do you know where this farm thing is and da 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 and um, and she was kind of uh, ignoring me and and I said um uh, Excuse me, ma'am. I said, how, how are you doing today? She said, I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I said, well, I'm blessed. And then all of a sudden behind me, this voice goes, what do you mean? And I'm like, and I look over my shoulder, and there's this big old guy with the, the wife beater shirt and the ball cap backwards and this big beard. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, what have I just stepped into? And, and I turn around, and I see parked out in the uh, driveway this tow truck. And I don't know if you've ever watched, like, those reality TV shows, but don't mess with tow truck drivers, you know what I mean? <laughs> so this guy's like, what do you mean? And I said, excuse me, sir, what do you mean you're blessed? I'm thinking, what kind of boldness does it take of someone to confront you in a convenience store and ask you what you mean? But I thought, okay, well, if he can be bold, I can be bold. I said, well, let me tell you. I said, I used to be a lying, thieving, cheating, drunk, adulterer, dope dealer, and I said, and Jesus Christ forgave me of my sins Amen. and set me free. I'm blessed. You've got to grab a hold of the fact that even being lost in the back country of Pennsylvania, New York, and having a tow truck driver about to beat you up doesn't change the fact that you're blessed. Amen? We're blessed because of what Christ did for us on the cross. We're blessed because forgiveness has been offered. We're blessed because there's a promise of new life to those who will surrender the old life to Him. I am blessed, man. And you are too. Now that you get the understanding of why you're blessed, tell your neighbor again, I'm blessed. Amen. Amen. Give yourself a hand. Praise God. We've been talking about, uh, in the month of June, we've been talking about being in Daddy's house, and so... Um, what I want to talk to uh, everyone today and share with you is the idea of restoration to Daddy's house, being restored to our Father's house. If any of you have ever been in a family tiff, if you've ever been at odds with another family member, sometimes you cannot be welcome. Come on, somebody. You can be kicked out, you can be disenfranchised, you can be removed, you can be disowned and disinherited. 
And some people out here today, and some people watching today, feel that way towards God. And they need to be restored in a relationship with God. They need to be brought back into the family fold. They need to be welcomed back into the household of God. Coming up in uh, September 15th is Back to Church Sunday. Back to Church Sunday. And it's an opportunity for, um, for Americans, for Christians, to say to their neighbor, to say to their friends, hey, come back to church. Because church attendance has declined in the last decade by almost 40%. In America. Now that says a lot of things, but it probably says that a lot of people, number one, feel like they're not welcome, and number two, a lot of people are thinking that church does not fit their lifestyle or who they are. And the reality is that the body of Christ is big, it is expansive, it's a, uh, um, it's a beautiful tapestry of all the different colors and tribes and tongues of people, the nations throughout the world come into the body of Christ. It didn't matter if I preached in South America or when I preached in other states of this nation or when I preached in Europe. Everywhere I go, the amazing thing is I find brothers and sisters who love Jesus and they love me and I love them. The body of Christ is big and we need to be able to get a mindset that says we're not going to be exclusionary to those who don't look like us and dress like us and who those who don't talk like us. And I think we need to get a hold of the fact that there's beauty in the difference within the body of Christ. Amen. We have a couple of uh, tree huggers in the upper room assembly and we have some far right, right wing uh, zealots in the upper room assembly. We got some in between apathetic people in the uh, uh, um, upper room assembly. We are blessed to have a full spectrum of believers here. So it tickles me how I can go hang out with some, some tree hugger Christians one, one week and you know, and they're all about peace and love, man, and let's go hang out in the woods and get back to Jesus. And I'm like, yo, dude, let's do it, man. And the next week I can be having lunch with someone that's like, Pastor, we need to get these things right and we got to go. And I'm like, yes, we got to get them right. <laughs> the body of Christ is big and it's large and it's beautiful. And there's a lot of people that have, um, well, they've got mad at a lot of preachers. They've been offended by a lot of people. Or let me just be honest with you, a lot of people got trapped up in some sin and got embarrassed and haven't come back. Amen? We need to let people know they can be restored to Daddy's house. Amen? I love this passage of Scripture. Everybody's probably familiar with it. If you're not, I just want to touch on it for a minute. It's Luke 15, 20. And it says this, But while he was still a long way off, someone say long way. I don't care where you're at right now. God sees you. Amen? You might feel like you're a long way off from Jesus, but God sees you. This is the story of the prodigal son. He, I mean, this guy wasn't someone that like fell into sin or got tricked into sin or whatever. He took his daddy's inheritance and started to go hang out with some hoes and party it up. He spent every bit of it and then wound up in a pigsty eating corn husk. I, I've blown it in my life sometimes, but I don't know if I've ever blown it that Well, maybe I have. But you have probably never blown it that big. Amen? You have probably never blown it that big. I, I, I Certainly I have. But yet, when he came to himself, and he said, man, my dad's got this big, beautiful house. He's got servants, and I wonder if dad will take me back if I went back to him and said, I'm sorry. I've sinned against your dad. So this, this guy's thinking this, and he, he starts on his journey back. And I can picture the father having this beautiful home on a hill with this road that winds down, and uh, um, he's out in his front yard. He's on his front porch, or actually back then, because they didn't have air condition, they had what was called the upper room, which was really just like a big balcony. The whole top of the house was like a balcony, and they would put their lawn furniture up there, and they would have um, um, like uh, palm uh, fronds as a, a roof, and they could sit up there in the open air, and I can picture Dad sitting up there in the open air on the top of the upper room. Hey, upper room, maybe. Yeah. Hanging out in the upper room and, and looking down the road and going, is that my son? Is that my son coming up the road? Jump down off the roof, run down there, and start running down the road, and runs to his son. 
And it says, but while he was uh, still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. You know, there's a lot of people right now that don't realize that God just wants to throw his arms around them and kiss them. There's a lot of people that think God is mad at them. And you know what? God may be spanking them for what you've done. He's a good daddy. And he spanks his children when they need a good spanking. Amen? But he never spanks you out of anger. And he never spanks you to destroy you. I've often thought when I've blown it in my life that, man, God could just wipe me out at any moment. But instead of wiping me out, he's always trying to restore me to himself. Instead of uh, destroying me, he's always trying to heal me. And there's a lot of people that need to be convinced of that. There's a lot of people that blew it. A lot of, I've met so many people that say, well, you know, I was in church once. I was a Sunday school teacher. I was a this and I was a that. And like, Don't rest on what you were. Come run into your heavenly Father now and find out what you can become. Amen? So I believe there's a lot of people that need to know that they can be restored. That God is not against them. He's not trying to destroy them. He's not trying to take them out, snuff them out, wipe them out, or remove them from the face of the earth. If that was the case, they would be gone. But the fact that you have breath today tells me that God is trying to reach you today. Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. Amen? And, and I intend to prove to you by the Scripture today that you can blow it magnificently. That you can blow it in a way that is really beyond what you think you're capable of blowing it. In fact, I, um, I remember one time I was um, sitting in a uh, church in Wanshees, North Carolina. I went back home to do some visiting after I got out of prison and I had been asked to come and share my testimony at the Methodist Church in Wanshees, North Carolina. And so I went down there and I shared my testimony and it was just a good time. It was wonderful. And um, a couple of weeks later, I was back in town. And so I thought I would just stop by and see the pastor and sit in on his message, sit in his sermon, and, and just fellowship and just kind of show my support for him. And I'm sitting there in the congregation and I'm... I'm uh, just enjoying the service. We just got done with the, the hymns and we were just worshiping and we're sitting down. And I, I notice off to my right, there's a woman sitting there in a wheelchair. And she's sitting there with her husband. I didn't recognize the lady. I didn't know who she was. And she was sitting there and, and I didn't think anything of it. She's down there in a wheelchair. And all of a sudden, it was like just this overwhelming something inside me saying, look down there. And I look down there. And I look down there and I see the woman just stand up in the middle of the service. I, I shake my head, and, I look, and she's, she's sitting there. And I thought, I, I just imagine that? Okay, get back on the message. Get back on the sermon there. And I'm listening to it. All of a sudden, man, this overwhelming thing. Look down there again. And I look down there again, and she stands up again. I'm like, what in the world? And she sits back down. Or she, When I wipe my eyes, she was seated again. I'm thinking, all right, right, I'm. this woman is not just standing up in the middle of the sermon. I'm just hallucinating here. I'm freaking out. Get your mind together, Eric. Just pay attention to the preacher. Amen, somebody said. And then all of a sudden, that overwhelming thing came on me again. And I looked down there this time, and there I am standing over her, laying my hand on her, praying for her. Now I'm freaking out. I'm going, oh, no. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to pray for her. And I thought, Lord, I'm in a Methodist church. They don't do that here. Lord, do you want me to get up right now in the middle of the service? The preacher's preaching. I can't do this. I can't do it, Lord. I can't do it. I can't. I'm not. Lord, these people know me. They, I, I, they're going to think, Lord, I can't. And I spent the rest of that service arguing with God on why I couldn't do what he wanted me to do to go down and pray for this woman to be able to get up out of that wheelchair and walk. I was ashamed. I was afraid. I thought, what are people going to think of me? They're going to think I'm a nut. You don't do stuff like this. You don't walk into someone. I'm not going to rationalize this thing. And I spent this whole service rationalizing why I shouldn't go pray for this woman. Why I shouldn't obey God. 
why I shouldn't let the Holy Spirit lead me. The end of the service comes, and um, everybody's filing out the front doors, and I go over, and I just now I'm just freaking out, and I'm like, all right, I gotta, should I try to go pray for him now? Or, because I knew the moment had passed. The anointing had passed. The presence of God had passed. It was done, and I missed it. Come on, somebody. I know you ain't never missed it, but I missed it. And so I go over to him, and I'm thinking, well, let me make this right. I can make this right. I'll go over there and pray for him now, and that's what I'll do. I'll just go pray for him. And I go over there, and I say, hey, guys, uh, how are y'all doing? And they're like, hey. And I said, who are y'all? And um, um, he said, I'm so-and-so. And he said, I was pastoring a church out in um, uh, the western part of the state. And um, he said, my wife came down with this disease, and we knew it was a spiritual attack. And we prayed and asked God what we should do. How should we handle this? And, and what, should, what should we do? And, and, and how's God going to move to heal her? And he said, we just felt uh, the Spirit of the Lord telling us to move back home here uh, to Wanchies. And we hadn't been here in 40 years. They were an older couple. So we hadn't lived here in 40 years. And we just believed God was going to bring us back here so he'd heal my wife so I could go back into ministry. And tears just started running down my cheeks. And I thought... What if I was the agent of God who was supposed to have brought that healing that morning? And I blew it because of my fear, my insecurity, my shame of Jesus, that I was more worried about what the people in that church would think of me than I was concerned with that woman being healed and concerned with obeying God. You see, because I had touted myself for some time before that, as being this great man of God that could do miracles in the name of Jesus. Well, you know, I've seen people healed of Parkinson's disease. I've called out demons. I've done this and I've done that. And I had all these accolades. But at the moment when I had to choose my reputation or Jesus' power and someone's healing, I blew it. I blew it. I know someone else in the Scripture who blew it like that. Let's take a look at him. You see, because Peter denied Jesus. He found himself in denial. And I've often heard the uh, term they use in AA and others. They say, uh, denial ain't just a river in Egypt, baby. Huh? It's a state you get in in your mind. Amen? <clears throat> it says here in Mark 14, starting in verse 66, it said, meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. Now, I want to set the tone just for a second here. He's in the courtyard. In the courtyard where? He's in the courtyard of the high priest. Jesus had just told Peter the night before, you're going to deny me three times before the sun rises. Before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times. You'll deny you even know me. Jesus had just, uh, or Peter had just pulled out the sword just hours before to defend Jesus, cut a man's ear off, was willing to stand against a whole uh, police force that had come up on the Mount of Olives to grab Jesus, and now here's Jesus telling him, you're going to deny you even know me. Well, Peter wasn't, he's kind of like me, he wasn't a very humble dude, and he goes, what? Deny you? Lord, I will die with you. And the Lord turns to him and says, Peter, you need to understand something. Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. He said, but I've prayed for you that your faith will be strengthened and you will strengthen your brothers. Peter still wasn't down with this. He wasn't getting it. You see, because sometimes we don't see our own condition. Sometimes we think we've got it together, we're okay, and I'm fine. Leave me alone, preacher. I don't want to hear it. Amen. No, I forgot. Y'all are not like that. I get, I'm the one that gets in this condition. <sighs> There's a danger in thinking that you're okay outside of the will of God. There's a danger of thinking that you've got it together in places of your life where the Word of God and Jesus declares it ain't together. Come on, somebody. So Peter had just stood against the enemies of Jesus. He literally took a man's ear off in his great defense. And now Jesus is telling him, you're going to deny you even know me? He's like, Lord, didn't you see me a little while ago? Did you see me wield that sword, how bad I was? Deny you? I ain't going to deny you. 
I'll die with you. And I could just see Jesus going, wow, man. You don't get it, do you, dude? You ain't everything you think you are. Wow. See, before Peter denied Jesus, as we're getting ready to read, first Peter got in denial. He got in denial in the real condition of his life. He got in denial of the state of his mind. He got in denial of who he is and who God is. Come on, somebody. I read the other day that if you don't believe your own press clippings, you might have an opportunity to live up to them. Come on. If you don't, if you don't believe... Hey, are you in? So we see here in Mark 14, 6, 6, says, Meanwhile... Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servants' girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself by the fire. Come on. She looked at him closely and said, You were one of those with Jesus the Nazarene. But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. Now look at this. He, he, what? At first he's just going to kind of blow it off. I don't know what you're talking about, woman. Get away from me. What are you talking about? Um, so he started out with just an easy denial, a little denial. But Peter denied, I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And when he went out into the entryway, just then a rooster crow, cock a doodle doo. I wonder if he took notice at that moment. I'm slipping. I'm slipping here, baby. Probably not. He was like, oh, morning's coming. Went on his business. <clears throat> Verse 69, and when the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling others. Now she, she done confronted him, now she's going to go tell some others. This man is definitely one of them. Hmm. <clears throat> In verse 70, but Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, you must be one of them because you're a Galilean. If you're in the King James Version, in verse 70 it says this, that because you're... Uh, language betrayeth you. In other words, he had the slang of a Galilean. You see, even there, they had the, the northern, southern dialect. You could tell when someone was from your neighborhood or not just by the way they talked. Hmm? And so they, he recognized, they recognized the way he was talking and said, No, you one of them. Hmm? He says here, now look at this, verse 71. Peter swore. Now the man, look, I, it ain't nothing worse than a Christian when we get tripped up and then we say things out of our mouth and we ain't got no business saying. Amen? Amen. We feel so stupid and so small and so little when we say a cuss word or something we know we had no business saying. We're like, ugh, ugh, how do I, ugh. Don't you? Okay, maybe y'all don't. Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. Whoa, hold on. He went from I don't know what you're talking about to I don't know this man. Wow. Now it's a direct, direct denial of Jesus Christ. A direct denial of even knowing who this guy is. Wow. Wow. How the mighty have fallen. Where's your sword now, Peter? Where's your sword now? Now look at this in verse 72. And immediately the ro rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he broke down and wept. Wow. I walked out of that Methodist church today. I went over there and I thought to myself, here's this pastor and his wife and, and uh, this guy's believing for healing. He left this church. He left the ministry to obey the Word of God, to bring his wife back to Juan Cheese, hoping that upon hope that somewhere Christ was going to have someone in his life to bring healing to his wife. And I'm having these weird visions and flashes. And, and listen, I wasn't someone who had not seen healings before. I had seen them over and over and over again. I had went to pray for someone one time who had a burst appendix. And before my hand could touch them, like blue fire came out of my hand, hit that man's body. He stood upon his feet and said, I'm healed. 
you would think, well, gee, Eric, if you've seen that, why in the world didn't you get up and go pray for that woman? Yeah, I was asking myself the same thing. How could I deny Jesus in that moment? Why was I afraid of what these people in my hometown were going to think about me? I felt weak and scared and ashamed. And I was riding home back to a husky that day and the whole way in the car just beating myself up. What is wrong with you, man? How could you do that? This what? Uh, you felt the anointing. You saw God showing you. All you had to do is get up and go over there and say, Arise and walk in the name of Jesus. All you had to do is do something, Eric. Why didn't you do it? I know out there right now there's a lot of people. You might not have blew it like I blew it, but you've blown it in your own way. And you feel like, man, I'm just the worst thing there is. I'm this, I'm that. And you need a restoring touch of your Heavenly Father. You see, I went back and, um, to uh, Hosky. I went back to my duties and I get a call one day. I was the on-call chaplain there for hospice and uh, uh, Pastor Wallace Phillips of the carpenter shop normally filled that duty. When he was out of the office, I filled that duty. And I get this call that an um, 11-year-old girl had dropped dead in school that day, in the elementary school over in Ahoski. We need you over here. I think, oh, wow, okay, all right, all right, I jump up and I go over there. I'm comforting the family. I'm talking to them. I'm sitting with them. And just in the other room, we can see there's the little girl laying with a blanket over her and a sheet over her. And I'm thinking, oh, man. And um, all of a sudden, I look in there and I see her sit up. I thought, not again. Not again, Lord. And I look in there again, and she's not sitting up. I'm just seeing these things. And I hear the Holy Spirit say, can she live? I, I didn't even want to answer. I know what the Scriptures say. I know how many people have been raised from the dead in the Word of God. You know, I'm a religious guy. I thought, yes, Lord, she can live if you make her live. He said, go in there and pray for her. I said, oh, God. All the medical staff are in there preparing her body for the morgue. And I thought, I can't do this, man. I can't do this. But all I could think of what just happened the week before where I denied the Lord. And I said, okay, Lord. I said, these people in this hospital know me. They know I'm on staff over here at this church. They, I said, all right, I'll do it. And I walk in there, and the physician was standing there, and the nurses, and I said, can I pray for this young lady? And they're looking at me like, uh, yeah, she's dead. Um, I said, okay. And I pulled a blanket back. I put my hand on her head, and I said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and live. And guess what happened? Nothing. I felt like a total fool, a complete idiot. I felt like I had violated um, these doctors in there because they're all looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? Rise up and live. And that's all I knew to do was to obey my Lord because I was so ashamed of not obeying Him the week before. And I so wanted to be restored into His good graces. I didn't care what He asked me to do. I was going to do it. And I thought, nothing happened, God, why? And I thought the Holy Spirit saying, I just wanted to know if you would. And then just a few weeks later, I was back in the Outer Banks. I was preaching a revival at the Ocracoke Assembly of God. This is a little island in a little tiny church, if you've never been there. Six whole people showing up to this revival night after night. And on the third night of the revival, this lady comes in being helped in, and she's got a walker. And she comes in, and, and uh, she hadn't been to the other nights of the revival. And she comes up at the end of the service, as I would pray for everybody. And she said, um, she said I have uh, brain cancer. I have a tumor in my lungs. And they put me on hospice care, and they say there's no hope for me. She said, but I got hope in Jesus. Preacher, will you pray for me? And I started crying. I said, you know what? 
Dear, you've got great faith, and I'd be proud to pray for you. And I begin to call from heaven for healing on this body. I begin to curse the tumor and the cancers in that body. I begin to well up with faith, believing that God can do anything. And a couple of weeks later, as I was sitting in my office there at the carpenter shop, I get a postcard from this lady saying I had been cleared of all cancer from my doctor. I am healed in the name of Jesus. I wish I could have undone what had happened that first time at that first church. But the truth was I had denied Jesus. Denied him in a moment when he was ready to do a great healing in someone's life who was desperately wanting that healing from him. And I needed to be restored. And the Lord did something silly to restore me. He had me go in and pray for a corpse. But a couple of weeks later, he had confirmed in me, Son, I've restored you. Just trust me. You see... Repentance brings restoration, guys. Repentance brings restoration. I, I, I started in verse 15 on here, but if you don't mind, I'm going I'm to go to John 21 real quick, and I'm going to begin to read um, some of the earlier uh, verses before we get to verse 15 on there. I'm in the uh, book of John, Gospel of John, chapter 21. And um, here we are in this point in the passage of Scripture, where Jesus has now been raised from the dead. <clears throat> but Peter doesn't know it yet. Peter doesn't know it yet. You see, this guy who walked on water, this guy who walked with Jesus and saw him restore the blind and raise the dead, this guy who had seen the Lord calm the storms with a simple word, this man, Peter had in the end denied his Lord. And he was broken in spirit and broken in mind. And so it starts out in chapter 21. It says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Let me stop right there and say this to you. There's so many times when you find yourself blowing it. So many times when you find that you have denied the Lord. So many times when you thought you were this and you found out you were this. You turn around and go back to your old life. Instead of pressing on in the new life, we go back to the old life. So here was Peter going, I'm going fishing. What, Peter, What? You blew it, dude. We understand you blew it, but why are you going back to your old life? He's saying, that's all I got. I blew it. That's all I got. I'm going back. I'm going fishing. You see, he was a fisherman. So many people go back to their old lives once they blow it, and I'm here to tell you that repentance brings restoration. God don't want you going back to your old life because he's got a magnificent new life for you. It says here, and Peter said, no, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. Hold on. You mean when I blow it and I go a certain way, I can lead others astray too? Come on, somebody. Hmm. And they went out immediately and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. It's amazing when you go back to your old life, God don't let you get nothing. Somebody say amen. We're going with you also. We got we fished all night, got nothing. Verse 4. But when the morning... When the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, <clears throat> and yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they, oh, they obeyed. So they cast their net out, and they were not able to draw it in because there were so many fish in it. Wow. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! Wow! Now when Simon Peter heard this, that it was the Lord, he put on his jacket, 
for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. You see, God knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in there. He knows what's in there. Peter loved Jesus, and he blew it big time. So all of a sudden, they're out there fishing, and, and, and they say, that dude out there, that's Jesus. And Peter didn't wait around. This guy grabs his clothes and dives into the water and starts swimming for the beach. He is so excited. For just a moment, he forgot that he blew it. He just wanted to get back to Jesus. Come on, somebody. It says here in verse 8, But then the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not that far from land, about 200 yards, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring me some of the fish that you've just caught. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of the large fish, 153 fish. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Man, this dude's so excited. He went over there and starts pulling that net. He's like, Jesus, I'll get you some fish, man. Come on. You see, sometimes when we're so want to get back with the Lord, we try to do it in our own strength. Come on, somebody. If, well, if I, could just, if I could just give enough, if I could serve enough, if I could paint the church or feed the poor, if I could... Jesus... Had, had, had appeared to them, and Peter just thought, man, he dives in the boat so zealous. The guy was a nut. Thank the Lord for nuts in Jesus. Amen? He dives in the boat. He swims there. The boat finally comes in. Jesus says, hey, can I have a couple of those fish? He says, yeah, Lord, I'll get them for you. He starts pulling the net in by himself because he just, you just want to prove that I'm, I'm going to serve the Lord. And then we get down here. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? They couldn't even recognize him because of his, his glorified body, his resurrected body. They're like, whoa, man, who is this? And then Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This now was the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now we pick up in verse 15 here. So when they had eaten the breakfast. I know this is a small point, but it's one I want to stop and make. Wow. Jesus showed up and cooked breakfast for the dude that just denied him three times. If God was this overbearing, mean God just out to get you, do you think he would show up and make you breakfast? He cooked him breakfast. I got to tell you, man, sometimes when people blow it, I don't cook them breakfast. And let me just be honest with you, even when I blow it sometimes, I don't cook myself breakfast. I'm busy beating myself up. Somebody can say amen to that. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Whoa, what kind of question is that? Do you love me more than these? Hmm. He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, Then feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Wow. He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, Then tend my sheep. Verse 17 he said to him the third time. The third time? Yeah, he denied him three times. And Jesus is restoring him three times. Come on, somebody. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? Peter's like, man, you're going to keep asking me this? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Why in the world did Jesus do that? Let me tell you. 
the same way that I went and prayed for someone and nothing happened. Because when we do certain things in life, when we engage in certain activities, when we uh, uh, act certain ways, it scars our soul. It, 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 it puts in a groove, if you will, in your memory line. It, it sets you in a pattern. It can set in place a stronghold. It can become habitual. Come on, somebody. Habit forming. The Lord was not just trying to mock Peter. He was not trying to, to embarrass Peter. He was not trying to make him look bad in front of the other people. God was not trying to make me look like a fool in front of those doctors. He was saying, in the area that you blew it, I'm going to restore you. In the area that you got afraid, I'm going to bring boldness. In the area that you don't think you can do it, I'm going to show you that you can do it. You see, he brought repentance. Repentance, they saying, I'm sorry, Lord. I was sorry. But you can be sorry and go fishing. How about be sorry and then change your behavior and start doing it the way he said to it? That's repentance. And repentance brings restoration. And so not only are there people who need to be restored to the household of God, not only are there people who need to be restored in their relationship with their Heavenly Father, but you are stuck in some places of your life because there was something God said do. There was something God said I want. There was something God said go. There was somewhere that God spoke to you and you stopped and said I can't. And you're still there. Oh, you might have moved on. I mean, how many people do we see go through marriage after marriage? Because there's one area of their life, God said, let me deal with this area of your life. And you're like, I can't let you touch that area of my life, God. And so they end up in relationship after relationship with that same thing showing up every time. And God's saying, if you would just let me restore that, if you let me heal that, if you let me call that out of you, if you would repent of this, I can heal you. There were so many places in my life, so many areas in my life that God dealt with me specifically. He said, Eric, if you would just bring this forth, if you would lay it on the table, if you would be honest and open about it, I will heal it. You see, Satan wants us to keep our sin and hide it in the dark. He wants to take uh, the areas we've blown it and he wants us to act like it never happened and try to move on. But you ain't moved on because spiritually you're stuck there. And you went fishing. And God's saying, no, I'm not going to leave you there. No, I'm going to call you out of the darkness. I'm going to call you out of the grave. I'm going to call you out of that brokenness and I will restore it. I will heal it in Jesus' name. You've got to be willing to take it to Him. and Say, yes, Lord. Wherever that area is that you got stuck, wherever that area is that you just said that's too much, you're asking too much, God, I can't do it. Wherever that area is that fear held on to you, where, where uh, insecurity or embarrassment gripped you, wherever it was that you found yourself in denial, the Lord says, if you'll let me bring it out, I will heal it and restore you. So what does this say for us? Uh, I had to ask myself the question, am I stuck? And I had to ask you the question, are you stuck? Do you feel stuck? In your walk with the Lord? Do you feel hung up somewhere? I have many times. Many times. Felt stuck. Felt abandoned. Felt frustrated. And I got to tell you, sometimes years would go by and all of a sudden God would be taking me back to what I'd done a couple of years ago and say, now you ready to deal with this? Yes, Lord. You see, we try to move on without healing, and we never go anywhere. And God's trying to restore and heal so He can take you somewhere. Come on, somebody give Him a hand clap of praise for that. Amen. So the first thing I would just say is ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, show me. Am I stuck? Do I feel like I need to be restored? Do I, am I feeling outside of you? Am I, am I hiding from you? Am I going back my old way? Ask the Holy Spirit to show you. I heard a preacher say one time that uh, all you need to do is say, Lord, take me back to the last thing you asked me to do that I disobeyed. That's a tough... Whoa, what? Take me back to the last place that you clearly asked me to do something and I disobeyed you. Spiritually, we're talking about. Go back to that spot 
and say, okay, God, now I want to obey. Amen? You see, because people stop at different parts of their journey. Some people, they get saved, they join a church, they become a deacon, they get called to the ministry, and then they get cold feet. I don't want to be a preacher. And they're stuck. Some people are called to use their musical talents and gifts for the Lord, and, but you know, I, and they're stuck. And God's saying, come on, man. Do you love me more than these? And He wants to restore you and heal you. So ask the Lord, where's the last place I disobeyed Him? Where's the last place that I bailed out on His plan for my life? Because I was thinking, well, no way, that's crazy. I remember um, when God offered me the opportunity to start this church. And I said, Lord, I can't be a preacher. I said, you know, like, like ex-dope dealer tough guys can't be preachers. I said, you know, you've got to have the little glasses with the white collar. That's not me. Amen. And um, so I, I bailed out on God's plan. I said, no, nah, I can't do this. So Satan came with a counteroffer. Come on, somebody. He had a counteroffer. Oh, it wasn't like going back to drug dealing or nothing. No, he was offering me, why don't you go get a shrimp boat? Why don't you go do something other than what God's called you to do? And in my case, it was literally like, Peter, why don't you go fishing? I was like, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. You see, the moment we get stuck, a counteroffer comes to go back. When the Lord's saying, no, I've got a call that draws you forward. Amen? So you've got to ask the Holy Spirit to show you. The second thing is, is let the Lord bring you through repentance. Guys, it's tough. It's tough. I can't tell you how much I trembled and shook that day in that hospital. Thinking, I can't go in there and pray for this dead little girl, Lord. It's crazy. It's insane. I'm going to look like an idiot. And then I thought, isn't that what I was just saying to you a couple of weeks ago in that church? I'm sorry, Lord, I'll do it. I'll do it. And a lot of people would say, well, a miracle didn't take place that day, Pastor Eric. Nothing happened. Yeah, it did. That girl might not raise off that table, but I was restored to the Lord. Someone give him a hand clap of praise. Amen. A miracle did take place that day. A miracle did take place that day. And a couple of weeks later, I got to see that miracle being carried out in someone's life who was healed of cancer. Let the Lord take you through repentance. Don't just say, I'm sorry. Say, God, I'll go ahead. Whatever you need to do, come on, man, let's do it. I'm yours. Don't you try to pull the fish in. Let Jesus show you where he needs to restore you. Isn't it amazing that Peter could have built boats, pulled the fish in, painted churches, built synagogues. He could have done all these good works. But all he needed to do was say, yes, Lord, I love you more than these. Yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord. See, he had to undo the denial with the confession of love. Three times he denied, three times he confessed, I love you. Amen? Let God restore you in a way that he knows it needs to happen. And then the last thing I would challenge you to do is fulfill your call and destiny. I remember a man telling me one time, he said, I went to go preach at a nursing home. And he said, I was going heading there to go preach. He was 19 years old. He'd just been called into ministry himself. He was this young kid, man, excited about going to go preach. He's going to go preach to this nursing home. And he gets there, and the Lord says, I want you to preach a message on being called into the ministry. He said, Lord, these people are all in wheelchairs. They're all broke down and old and this and that. And he said, I can't preach to them about being called into ministry. And the Lord said, I said, preach a message on being called into the ministry. So this 19-year-old kid walks into this nursing home, preaches this message on, with all the fire he's got on being called into the ministry. And he said at the end, an 87-year-old man walks up with tears and says, Son, when I was your age, after college, the Lord told me to go into the ministry. And he said, instead, I went on to become an engineer and become successful and wealthy. He said, but now I'm all alone here in this nursing home and my kids have got my money and they've gone on. He said, do you think God can forgive me and let me go back into ministry now? And of course God could. He restored that 87-year-old man that day and that guy began to minister at that nursing home until he passed away. God hasn't forgot what he's called you for. God, listen, you didn't choose your eye color. You didn't choose your skin color. You didn't choose your height. You didn't choose your sex. You didn't choose any of those things. 
So if God chose them for you, don't you think he chose a plan and a path for your life? You better believe he has. Haven't you ever looked in the mirror and said, why do I got a nose like this? Why is my personality like that? Why, 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 why? Of course you have. Everybody's looked in the mirror and asked those questions about your own life. The reason you've got what you've got is because God's got a plan for you that's designed just for you. So I would say, when God restores you, I don't care where you're at in your life, fulfill the call and the destiny He has for your soul. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. I want to speak a blessing over you, and then our elders will be available. Anybody just says, I need prayer. I need prayer for healing. I just want to pray. I want to praise God. Whatever you need, the elders will be available to minister to you. And before you leave here today, you hug someone and tell them you love them and thank them for being here. Father, in Jesus' name, I release a blessing of peace over the assembled congregation and everyone watching this service today, O oh God. I speak, O oh God, restoration, healing, O oh God. Let the spirit of denial be broken. Lord God, let people be restored to the household of faith. Let people be restored into the kingdom of God. Let people be restored to the calling and destiny, O oh God. Lord, we speak it now, we believe it, that even in these words have gone forth, Father, people are being called back to you and restored to their rightful place in the kingdom of God and in their daddy's house. In Jesus' name, and everybody who agreed said amen and amen. Give the Lord another hand clap of praise in the house.